Hello, everyone, and welcome to Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. Our guest this week is one of the most prominent and influential people in the world of international sport. But you may not recognize either her name or her face. She is Stacy Allister, currently the CEO of Professional Tennis at the United States Tennis Association and the tournament director of the U.S. Open. Prior to this, Stacy was chair and CEO of the Women's Tennis Association and way back, the executive director of the Canadian Open, which would strongly suggest that, yes, she is Canadian. We sat down with Stacy recently at the USTA in Orlando, Florida. Jim, welcome to beautiful Lake Nona, Florida, here in February where it is sun is shining and we are at the beautiful USTA National Campus. Well, it's too bad we're not outside, but I'll tell you this is an amazing facility, not just in this building, but throughout the campus. It's this great. This really is um, the best training center and the largest tennis center in the world. Well, it's great to be here. And I want to start by asking you, uh, you grew up in Welland, Ontario, just yes, beside... the metropolis, yes. The metropolis <laughs> yes. of Welland, uh, just beside Niagara Falls. But I think it's safe to say that there are very few men or women who were born and raised in Canada who grew up to become major executives in an international sport like tennis. And it's a pretty classic story of in your case, starting at the bottom and working your way up. Tell us how you got into tennis as a kid. So I was one of those lucky kids uh, in the eighth grade. It was an Ontario Tennis Association program, so it'd be like a state association program. They wanted to get more boys and girls playing tennis. They went around to the elementary schools and they chose one boy, one girl from each school. I got a racket, six weeks of lessons, uh, and a membership at the Community Tennis Club, the Welland Tennis Club. And that's how it all began. And you worked your way up from there. You oh, literally I, was, were I sweeping every, courts. I did every job in, in, uh, in tennis, from cleaning the red clay courts, watering the red clay courts. Uh, then I started teaching. Then I became the director of the club. Uh, then, uh, you know, sponsorship and getting people to come and play. I did the janitorial work. One of the best was taking this 50-pound almost like a lawnmower in the indoor club. And that's how we clean the fuzz off the courts. Honestly, I think the thing almost weighed as much as I did at the time. <laughs> you know, in those years, I guess the mid 70s, just about every young girl in Canada probably wanted to grow up to be the next Dorothy Hamill or Peggy Fleming. Did you want to grow up to be the next Billie Jean King? Well, for me, I got the, the great opportunity to really watch Chrissy and Martina. And Billy at that time uh, wasn't in the, in the purview on the scene. So uh, I had a backhand like Chris Everett, at least a wannabe backhand like Chris Everett. And, uh, and then I was just uh, really in love with uh, Monica Seles and Steffi Graf. So those were the, the players that I really got to, to follow and, and fall in love with. But I, don't, I never, in this five foot, one and a half on a good hair day, a uh, physical specimen that I am, I knew that you know the pro world was never going to be for me. But So you ended up getting into the admin side of tennis, uh, first of all in Ontario, then you went on to become vice president of Tennis Canada and uh, tournament director of the Toronto mm -hmm. version, not version, but the Toronto side of the Canadian Open because there was Toronto and Montreal. You were the first woman to hold that job. As egalitarian as tennis seems to be, <laughs> did you then, and for that matter, do you now, still feel the sting of discrimination from men? Uh, there's no doubt that uh, we are the sport of equality, but we still have a long way to go, particularly on gender and race. And <clears throat> it is still rare in 2022 that I would sit in an international meeting uh, and I'm generally the only woman in this 2022. So I'm, you know, it's, I don't really feel the discrimination anymore. Kind of made it. <laughs> I certainly did in the early years. Uh, and I certainly have felt gender bias throughout my almost 40 years of, of uh, working in tennis. But, you know, uh, I've had great role models like Billie Jean King 
uh, and others, and uh, my mother and my grand grandmother, and uh, it's just taught me to keep advocating for equality and uh, and creating opportunities for the next generation, because so many created the opportunities for me. Well, after a great career at Tennis Canada in 2006, you landed probably the dream job that you never thought you well, would get. Every job's kind of been a, like the dream and, and it's still, I still pinch myself today. It's been a nice progression. But back then, you got to be asked to move to St. Petersburg, Florida and become the president of the Women's Tennis Association, which had been founded about 30 years earlier, a little more than 30 years earlier, by Billie Jean and a number of other uh, professional tennis women then. What was your mandate at the WTA and what achievements did you make in those years that you were there? It really was going around the world, talking to tournament members and to players around how we were going to evolve the sport so we could grow it. That was one of the primary responsibilities in the early years. And the other uh, one was uh, equal prize money at Wimbledon and Roland Garros. And we were on the one yard line. We were 93% there. And there were many administrators before me and before Larry and many athletes, particularly Billy and Chrissy and Martina, who had built and advocated for decades for equality at those final two slams. So um, that was uh, in my portfolio, working with a, a great team. And in 2007, we finally achieved what so many had worked um, for, uh, and in particular, our modern day Billie Jean King, Venus Williams, was the player advocate at that time that helped us get, get it over the line. Well, you ultimately went on to become chair and CEO of the Women's Tennis Association, which I should explain is the Women's Tennis Tour, which is the body that takes the women players to tournaments around the world. But after nine years at the WTA, you left. Why? Well, um, I had been traveling the world about uh, approximately 150 days a year. The WTA is 55 events in 33 countries. And one of my uh, priorities during my tenure as CEO was the uh, development of the sport in Asia Pacific. And culturally, uh, they want to see the person leading the organization in those cultures. Uh, <clears throat> two young kids, uh, my husband John is the CEO of the Milkovich household and uh, a modern day uh, partner in life where he stepped back from his career. We we're fortunate that he could stay home and so I miss the kids and the family, but I never had to worry about them. But after 10 years of doing that and the grind of doing that at that stage in my life and uh, 15 years at Tennis Canada and three years at the OTA, you know, I just, I, I burnt out. I wanted, was one of those classic female professionals, uh, working mom, who put myself last. And it was, it was a mistake. And, you know, really, you know, you can look back on it now, your job as a leader is to manage your energy, and I didn't. Well, your hiatus from... <laughs> Last long. From, exactly, <laughs> that's that what I was going to say. Six <laughs> months later, lo and uh, behold, yes, Stacy Allister <laughs> joins the U.S. Tennis Association as head of the professional division. You must have been both thrilled and scared at the same time of the responsibility you were taking on. And we'll talk about the U.S. Open in a minute, but uh, as head of pro tennis, tell me what your duties are today. And again, what significant changes or improvements have you been able to make in these roughly six years since you started? So in the, in the pro space, I'm in the pro operations, the event side. Uh, we own uh, a tournament in Cincinnati called the Western Southern Open, very similar to the National Bank Open in Canada, a Masters 1000 on the men's and women's. So that's in my portfolio. Uh, we have the entry level of professional tennis, so the team that runs 120 entry level professional events, which are the foundation for um, pros, young players to aspire to up into the ATP and the WTA. Um, all of the international team competitions, the Olympic Games, Billie Jean King Cup, 
what's called Davis Cup, all the, the uh, Pan Am games, wheelchair tennis falls in uh, my portfolio on the, on the pro side. And then I have officiating, and there are 2,500 officials in the United States, and they are some of the most unsung heroes of our sport, who are incredibly dedicated and We have 10,000 events across the country. So uh, officiating is in the portfolio. And then I have this little event in New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me now jump to that. About three years ago, in addition to all the duties that you've just described, you became the tournament director of the U.S. Open at Flushing Meadow in New York. And presumably, anyone would think that would be a full-time job in itself. How do you manage both? Well, I have a phenomenal team. That's, you know, I, and I'm, I mean that with all of my heart and sincerity you know, of really, really attracted great talent. And all of those portfolios that I've described, uh, the, the leadership of that group, they make me look great every day. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's ironic, but 2020 was my first. And for context, the US Open is the largest annual sporting event in the world. And that was during the global pandemic. And it was the first international event in the world to be staged in New York City where <clears throat> the pandemic had raged uh, and taken so many lives uh, before that. So I was, I'm an expert in crisis management. Well, I was going to say, how big a challenge was that? Your first tournament as tournament director, you're dealing with a pandemic that nobody had ever dealt with before. It was uh, without question the most difficult uh, work experience I've ever had in my career. And um, it, I think personally, for me, it was the first. And uh, the two things were said to me as we began to, well, three things. No way we could stage the event without fans. Inside the house, nope, that's crazy, not happening. Uh, players didn't want it, management didn't want it. So convincing stakeholders that we could do it and we were lucky, other sports paved the way. Uh, number two, uh, both tours did not want us to stage the US Open in 2020. Wow. So we had the headwinds of the tours, predominantly uh, the players. Some were scared. Some just wanted the sport to start in Europe uh, where things weren't as bad. You know, what the WTA was worried about and you know, they, they supported us once we made the decision. We don't want anyone to die. And so I personally took that very, very seriously. Our staff were concerned. It was a big, it was a big undertaking of an unknown because we didn't know how to live with the pandemic. Lastly, someone senior said to me, we're counting on you, Stace, to stage the US Open because of the financial impact it would have had. It still had a phenomenal financial impact on our organization. It would have just crushed. You pulled it off. And, we pulled it off. And you uh, pulled look, it off again in look, 2021. There's a phenomenal team. Uh, I'm one member of what I will call the greatest sport event management company in the world. I, and I can say that with credibility because of my years of being in the sport, around the world, uh, and in the industry. Talking about organizations involved in tennis, uh, I think a lot of tennis fans may not be aware of the fact that while men and women play the majors, the Grand Slam events, the US Open, Wimbledon, French Open, Australian Open in tandem, the rest of the year, or almost all the tournaments in the rest of the year are played separately. There are two separate tours, the Women's Tennis Association Tour, and on the men's side, the uh, Association of Tennis Professionals Tour. And they've been separate for over 50 years. There is talk though now, and in fact, uh, Roger Federer even raised it uh, a couple of months ago. Is it now time to merge these two tours together? What's your view of that proposal, that initiative, and how would it affect the USTA and the US Open? Well, it was always the right time. Billy uh, always wanted the men and women to be together. But back in 1973, <clears throat> uh, that's just not the way um, that uh, the guys wanted it. 
I sit here today and I can say that both tours are cooperating. The largest events on both the ATP and the WTA tour are combined. The National Bank Open in Canada, it's combined in the same week, just different cities, which is a very unique business model. But the Western Southern Open uh, is uh, held together. Uh, upcoming in a few weeks, it will be the BNP Paribas and Indian Wells and the Miami Open. So the largest events on both tours are men and women combined. But they operate with two different organizations. So they are working together more closely on marketing and some operations, some areas of product, the commercial, is the big hurdle and governance. And uh, the conversations are on. It's not an easy thing to pull together, but there's a good intent to work more collaboratively. Over in the world of professional golf, as you would be aware, uh, we're now just in a bit of a state of flux because the European tour, which has been around for decades, has just received a major infusion of money from the Saudi Arabians and a new Asian tour, which is headed by Greg Norman, uh, no less, has also received a lot of Saudi money. And this is great for the professional golfers because it's offering them uh, way more prize money than they've uh, been able to play for, you know, just on the PGA Tour. But it's these two initiatives are creating quite a threat to the uh, power and status of the PGA Tour. Do you see anything similar, and maybe the merger of these two other tours, but even an influx of new sponsorship money from somewhere else happening in tennis and being a threat to the USTA? Well, I, I think that uh, we can never take our eye off of those who would like to come into our club <laughs> and you can never sit complacent with your business. I think everyone knows that. And um, we've got to keep progressing, uh, whether that be elevating our, our product, working more collaboratively, those seven different governing bodies for one sport so that can help to make us stronger, more, more sponsorship, more revenue um, for the athletes. But others have, you know, we've had disruptors come into the game and those 50 years, we will continue. Uh, and I think competition helps to foster uh, increased success. Let's talk about uh, tennis as it currently sits. What's your view of the current status? Obviously, there are lots of great young players coming along, many of them graduating from the campus right here that we're, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That we're situated in. But the era of Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Andy Murray, seems to be on the way out, notwithstanding the fact that Rafael Nadal just won the Australian Open. And on the women's side, the domination of Serena Williams appears to be uh, subsiding. Let's put it that way. I don't want to count anybody out here. Uh, you know, egalitarianism in sport is nice, but don't the fans like to see dominant players? And won't the lack of singular stars hurt the game for a while? We have been preparing as a sport for the transition of Roger and Rafa and Serena and Venus and Andy. For years. For years. Yes. Yes, I started talking about Venus's retirement in 2013. You know, and here we are, it's 2022. Um, we have been so fortunate. Um, um, this golden era, especially of uh, on the men's side, and we are watching the greatest of all time with Serena Williams and, and Venus. Um, the US Open in 2021 was exhibit A of how our sport is going to ultimately move forward. On that Monday of main draw, the whole conversation was no Rafa, no Fed, and no Serena. Yeah. By Tuesday, the story, the athletes did what they do. They are amazing. And if anything, you know, you do a qualifier, Emma Raducanu, the first ever of a Grand Slam. She never would have had that exposure, right? Uh, they, they, Leila Fernandez, all of a sudden, they are, like, they're all, anybody on any given day can win. Sometimes they don't get the spotlight. On the women's side, we saw two young champions <laughs> take down the, you know, the number one player in the world and, and the Olympic champ. It was phenomenal. And then 
on the men's side, unbelievable um, quality of tennis, and uh, they all just, they all rise up. Now, as a Canadian, you must be, you have to be impartial, of course, but you must be secretly thrilled to see the rise of so many Canadian tennis players, professional tennis players in the last three or four years. I mean, I'm talking about names like Leila Fernandez that you mentioned and Bianca Andreescu, who won the U.S. Open in 2019, and then Denis Shapovalov, Felix Auger-Aliassime, Milos Raonic, who was, was really a big up-and-comer about three or four years ago, but then has suffered injuries. But suddenly, uh, we are a tennis, we Canadians are a tennis powerhouse. Who ever would have thought? It was the dream. It was the dream when I was at Tennis Canada that we would have one player in the top 10, one. And I remember when I, I sat and watched uh, a Wimbledon one year and we had Milos and Jeannie Bouchard in the semis in the final, it was crazy. And now, when I sat there in 2019, uh, watching the GOAT, Serena, going for 24, and Bianca and Rescue came away and beat Serena in that 24,000 seat, screaming New Yorkers in the Arthur Ashe Stadium. That was a surreal moment. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought that. And then in 2021, <laughs> we, had, we had two Canadians, Emma's Canadian born, and another Canadian on the stage for the final, crazy. On the male side, yes. we just saw Rafael Nadal become the winningest Grand Slam yeah, was pro ever a with 21 match. in Melbourne, in Australia. Federer's at 20, um, Djokovic is at 20. Who, in your view, is the best male tennis player of all time? It may not be any of those. It, hasn't, it hasn't been determined yet, I don't think, Jim. And, you know, how, you know, just there's no way any of us would have thought that Rafael Nadal would win the Australian Open. Uh, he was on crutches a year, a month and a half ago. He had COVID at the start of the year. Uh, and he was down two sets. And Medvedev is playing unbelievable. So um, it, it remains to be seen. And, uh, you know, Novak's got time on his, on his, on his, hand, on his side. He does. He does. So I, you know, I think uh, he will um, surpass Roger and Rafa, and uh, that will probably answer that question. But all three of them with s s different dimensions, and that's what's so great about tennis. You have Roger with his style of play, and that battle between Roger and Rafa has been so fun to watch, like Agassi and Sampras. And uh, then you've had Novak coming in and, and challenging and taking those guys on at the same time. But we have been so lucky to watch them for so long. Uh, it's been phenomenal. You know, most fans would say tennis is a pretty serious sport. I mean, there's not a lot of necessarily good humor that goes on in <laughs> matches. Uh, they're playing at an intense level, so we've got to cut them some slack. But I'm wondering in all your years of tennis, What's the funniest incident you've ever seen? It was probably one that, uh, you know, never, never been, been on the air. But it was 2004 uh, in Toronto. It was the first year that we opened up the new stadium at uh, York University. And we got one of those classic uh, thunderstorms and too much rain came. And the photo pits filled up. And the photo pits would be about, you know, four feet. It's where the media, yeah, yeah. Uh, the two, photographers. Yeah, it was 2000, sorry, it was 2005, it was a women's event. And there's Kim Kleisters swimming in the photo pits with a ball crew. They were doing laps. So that is a true story. That's a good one. And um, yeah, I don't know if we have any video. We have some good photos of that though. You know, as someone who has said in the past that your being Canadian has really helped you along the way, even after you left Canada. What did you mean by that? Well, I'm working um, in a global sport, in a global world. And growing up in Canada, um, you know, I, I learned, a ra uh, learned to live in an Anglophone, in a Francophone, bilingual country. And a country that was much more diverse and much more tolerant and just culturally aware. And that really helped me 
um, when I was at the WTA in the president role and the CEO with 55 tournaments in 33 countries and being adaptive and being cognizant of how I needed to adapt my business style, my communication, um, understanding the traditions and respecting those traditions. It made me culturally aware and you know I think sometimes we think of Canadians as peacekeepers, uh, people who can bridge and I, I think I, I brought that also to the sport and maybe being a woman has helped as well. Predominantly you know very strong uh, men, former players, most of them and uh, I, I think it's been that combination that's been my secret competitive advantage. Stacy, you've had a great career and good luck in the years going forward. Thanks so much for joining us on Canada Files. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for coming down here to beautiful sunny Florida. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time with more Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of John and Margaret Deeks, as well as the following donors. Akito Investments Inc., The Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, Wendy Deeks, Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, Ted and Alice Kernahan, David and Cheryl Carr, Philip B. Lind, The Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, Francis and Eleanor Shen, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.